there were sort of like three three groups in the airport in Hawaii that we were all kind of looking at each other. Ah, I don't, you know, I wonder if this guy and these are going to go to the same place. And it was a, it looked like a husband wife team, a real big guy. And, and I remember sort of talking it up with him and he, he, he was checking out his fly box and all he had really brought were trigger fish flies. You remember this? Oh no, yeah. Yes, I do. And, uh, and, and, and I hadn't really put that on my radar as the quarry that we would be going after. But he started basically telling me that that's all he would go after were trigger fish. And that ended up becoming so fun to go after when we were there. I'm Mike Madrano, and this is the Tom Rowland Podcast. So today, what we've got, uh, a few years ago, I took my boys to Christmas Island, and it was one of the best trips we've ever had, and it was wonderful and made even better because we ran into another family there on the way, I think, in the Hawaii airport. We met up with another family, and they it was very similar. Dad, two boys, kind of celebrating, um, I don't know, maybe a high school graduation or something. I was kind of seeing them. I'm like, those guys look like they're going to the same place we're going to, and so we ended up talking sitting down, became fast friends. The boys got together. Uh, I got to be friends with this this person and we ended up fishing all week together and it was fantastic. Uh, that gentleman is Michael Madrano and he's joining us today because he has something that is really awesome. He's written this uh, book called Stilt Houses of Texas. I think you were working on this when we were probably back in Christmas Island days, weren't you? I think I had the idea for it. Yeah. Well, it looks like... It was like, early innings. Yeah, it looks like it has taken a lot of time, for sure, to uh, to, to write this book. Um, it is uh, a book about the stilt houses. Now, we have stilt houses in Florida, and they are um, kind of off the homestead area, kind of in Biscayne Bay a little bit. Um, but you have also these stilt houses in Texas. So what was it that made you want to do a book about the stilt houses? Tom, I, I, I have grown up on the Texas coast and, you know, so for the better part of my upbringing, fishing along uh, the coast of Texas, literally from Galveston all the way to South Texas, you, you can't help but notice that there's homes literally along the intercoastal. Some of them on Spoil Island, some of them literally uh, like the stilt houses in Florida in the water. And, and no one really ever talks about how those houses got there or, uh, or who has them. And so I, it was always intriguing to me that there was these homes. And, and sort of as a, as a young man, always thought to myself, one of these days, I'd love to fish on uh, one of those cabins. <laughs> and so, you know, it, it, it just t- sort of took 40 years for that to happen. But, but that's, that's really how it all started. So you just wanted to fish on one. Would you see yeah. when you're fishing by these things, would you see people like um, staying there and like enjoying that lifestyle? Like people are yeah, living I, there. I, I, I per, Not permanently, usually just sort of over the weekend. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so what, what's the, what's the legality here? Like, how did, how did these things start? Could anyone at one point, could anyone just go plop a stilt house somewhere? I'm sure that's not that case, not the case now, but how did it start? No, yeah, no, that's, that's actually, they, they used to call them squatters shacks. Okay. So they literally, uh, you know, back in, in the day when they were dredging the intracoastal canal through Texas, People literally just set up a a cabin or a, a shack along those spoil banks and set up shop, and and no one really said you couldn't do that. And that is actually the genesis for what we now know as the cabin program that's sanctioned by the state. Hmm. So, uh, and and that didn't really take place until '64 when they passed uh, 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 some legislation in the Texas House to acquire 
really those properties because it was on state land. But before, you know, if, if you had the wherewithal to go out there and put some pilings in the ground, you could have a shack on the intercoastal. Wow. And then along the, along the road there, something probably changed where, I mean, that's kind of like filling a wetland, right? Like you p- putting piles in the ground. I know in Florida, that's right. a real no, no. And, you know, you got to get a certain permit, you know, and that's, that's considered like a wetland kind of issue, which is a federal yeah. issue, right? Exactly. So it, did that change and all of a sudden they can't build anymore or what, what's the history of that? Yeah. So there were, there was some legislation that was passed in, uh, I believe it was 1964, uh, essentially acquiring, it was sort of a bundled uh, piece of legislation, but one of the uh, tenets to that piece of legislation was acquiring sort of an eminent domain, but I don't think they uh, paid uh, for the property, but essentially the state going in and, and claiming that those stilt houses were really uh, built on state property. And so now therefore became part of the state uh, property. And they put those cabins under the general land office, which is one of the uh, divisions in Texas that's really charged with leasing state property for, could be for natural resources or for oyster farming, et cetera. And so now these, call it 410, 408 cabins at the time, became part of the state under the purview of the general land office. And then you had to apply for a permit to to do anything, uh, make any improvements or to have a lease. That's how they set it up. And it's still that case today is you technically have a lease with the state uh, to occupy that uh, cabin. Hmm. But it's owned by sort of like a hunting lease. Right. You can make all the improvements in the world that you hmm. want, but they're going to convey to the landowner. In this case, the landowner is the state of Texas. Yeah. and so. That would, um, I guess at that point, there's no more. So there, there's kind of a premium on something like this. Like how would somebody get one at this point? Like, is there a way that you could buy one of these? Like if you can't build them anymore or you can't leave or, you know, what's the, I don't know how you would acquire one. It seems. Yeah. Well, it's, 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 it's not that complex, but it really is and has been a speakeasy. Um, and, and that's frankly why I got so interested and, and it seemed like it seemed really difficult at the time. No one really knew how to get one. Um, and it's really sort of an obscure, uh, division of the general land office. Uh, but the general land office, maybe once a year, maybe once every two years will auction off the right to, uh, build a cabin at your expense, again, owned by the state of Texas, but you're building it at your expense to enter into a lease agreement for, I think today they set them up for five years. That's the initial term. Um, And then they can be renewed. But uh, so, you know, there's not very many of them. Every couple of years, they'll have a little plot. Maybe it's a spoil area that they deem, or maybe one gets knocked away. And so they've reapportioned that into a different area. So they'll auction those off. Uh, they're really tough to get. The other way is is somehow uh, talk into, coerce, what have you, somebody who's got a permit to transfer it to you. Hmm. Now, is that pretty expensive? Like, I would think these things kind of run in the family. You know, it becomes a tradition. I know it does around the homestead area. I told you before, when we were talking before, that I had a client that would, you know, kind of ended up with one of these and it was a blessing and a curse because he had to keep it up, you know, and he didn't want to let it go because it was in the family. But I would imagine that that's kind of the thing here. Like it's a, it's kind of a family tradition probably to go out to these things. Yeah. I, I think that that's probably true. I, I, it'd be interesting to know what, what percentage is really like that, but, but that's the sense that I get. <laughs> it's so difficult to get one that once you get one, you don't want to let it go, even though, uh, that it, it, there's a lot of maintenance involved, as you could imagine. And, and none of these are accessible by land. So right. everything that you <laughs> do to that cabin, you have to bring by boat. Yeah. So what happens in hurricanes? With, with respect to what? Well, I mean, do they make it? I mean, it, some of these look kind of janky 
and you brought everything yeah. out here by boat. Let's see, I can actually show what your book looks like here. I'll put this down here. I mean, you can actually bring this stuff out here by boat. So, and it's shallow water. So you're probably, it's probably very, um, you can't bring a huge boat there. So you're right. bringing this out like a couple of two by fours at a time on occasion, I would imagine. So then you have yeah. a hurricane or something. I mean, I'm looking on the inside of these and they're kind of like a tree house, which is kind of the yeah. allure of them. You know, it's like, like Huck Finn, you know, you go out yeah. there and you, you stay in one of these, but are, do they do pretty well in the hurricanes? I, I would say uh, generally they don't do very well in a hurricane. Um, you know, it, 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 and knock on wood, mine is, mine's all the way down towards South Padre Island. And so if you know the Texas coast, South Padre Island, if you go any further south, you're in Mexico. Um, and, the, and these cabins start uh, in Galveston Bay, and they run all the way down to South Padre uh, Island with the vast majority, I'd probably say three quarters of these uh, really in South Texas from Corpus Christi on south. So that's the biggest congregation of these cabins. In that body of water, it is ultra shallow. And so I you know, again, that's the knocking on wood part. Generally speaking, that area, just in terms of storm surge, has less storm surge than the upper coast like Galveston because you have a deeper body of water. And, and that, that coupled with the wind is what knocks these things down. They get flooded and then they just, they don't, they don't hold up with all that water inside the cabins. Right. But down in far South Texas, they seem to do better because the storms don't have as much tidal surge. Hmm. Yeah. Man, what a cool, what a cool place. So how much time do you spend out at your, at your, at your cabin? Well, I think about it all the time. Uh, <laughs> but, but fortunately, I think maybe this weekend I'll have an opportunity to go down there and check it out. Yeah. Well, what's the weather like now for you? It, in Texas, it's, it's not bad. I think it's a little breezy down south for fishing. Um, and uh, I think they're, they're, they're forecasting a little bit of rain. So I, I don't know. Maybe it may be kind of dicey, but. Um, but, you know, we'll manufacture a good time if we have to. Yeah. So like a weekend out at one of, at, at your place kind of looks like you're just going to fish like all day and then just kind of come back, cook, cook, cook something and uh, and go to bed and then get up and fish again. You know, like you, you can fish these areas. Are they in such a remote area? Like I've, I've fished your where you're talking about where your cabin is before, like almost down in South Padre or South Padre, almost in Mexico. And you're getting in such a remote area that you just couldn't spend two days in that area. Is that kind of the, the, the allure of some of these places? Like you know, I, I think that's true. I, I mean, the only thing that I would add to the agenda is uh, I, I'm fortunate enough to have these, but I think most of the cabins are outfitted with lights. Yeah. And so, you know, the fishing really doesn't stop when you come back in the evening. Oh yeah. Uh, you, you, yeah, you crank the generators up, turn the lights on, and then it is like, you know, bait mecca, uh, which, you know, uh, translates into fishing mecca. And so it's usually really fun. I mean, I, I've, I've often had people out there and we we giggle at, <laughs> at how much bait fish and fish come up. So what I mean, you, I've had dolphins. What, dolphins? What, what about uh, eat, big trout and stuff like that? Like, do they come into the lights? Absolutely. And the redfish too? And the jack crevettes yep. probably? I, I haven't, I've never caught a jack. I presume that they would, uh, but I've literally had uh, dolphins come up and just, I mean, you just sit back and just watch the, the feeding frenzy going on. And that's, that's super cool. You know, Ernest Hemingway had a, uh, had a stilt house off of Key West and the stilt portion of the house is still there. It's right off Cottrell Key. And you, <clears throat> we would pass it every time. And I always thought the same thing, you know, how cool would it have been to go out to one of these stilt houses with like Ernest Hemingway, who knows what went on at that, at that stilt house, but it wasn't like he built his so far out. It was kind of like just a little bit off of Key West and, you know, across Northwest channel. And there's like, you can still see where it was, but it wasn't like he built it way out. But I did understand that at some point there were stilt houses in the Marquesas. And that's 25 miles off of Key West. And that seems to make a little more sense to me. Like 
you're going to really get away. Like where Ernest Hemingway built yeah. his, it was like five miles from Key West. So I don't know like why, why he would want to do that. But I mean, it's there, it was already quiet. Like Key West was a very small place yeah. at that time. And yeah. so then he wants to get even further away. I don't know. It's kind of funny when you think back on, on those days and stuff like that, it's like, there's a whole different opinion of crowds and a different opinion of, you know, he's probably thinking, uh, Key West, there's too many people here. You know, it's probably, a, I just want to get away a hundredth of yeah. the people that, that were there before, but the stilt houses have a cool history. Like, you know, you look all over the place, I guess there's and they have them in Louisiana. You know, I've, I've come across some kind of camps, you know, Yeah. but I don't know what that looks like. These look a little more established, <laughs> like the looking through your book here. These look, a there's little definitely, more there's definitely some cabins that you, that, that we've, that Tim photographed, we were together the whole time, but that really look more like a, like a beach house or a bay house than they do sort of like a fishing shack. I, I would say mine is more on the fishing shack side of the equation. Uh, but, but there's some of them, literally the, the cabin next door to mine is a two story structure that I think can house like 16 people. Hmm. I mean, it's, it's a monster. Yeah. That sounds like one of those cool um, duck hunting, duck hunting um, blinds that they have in some places where, you know, they're like three or four stories and they're cooking and, you know, shooting ducks. And usually in Louisiana, it's certainly a place that has more ducks than, than where I duck hunt because we try to really be, be <laughs> hide and stuff. But some people are able to do it with those three story places, which, again, is like it becomes like a tradition so that you can yeah. you can see that in people's families and. And then it stays there. Well, um, what was the, how did you pick Tim Romano as your photo photographer? You know, the, the, uh, the thought behind the book originally was to, to team up with fly fishing guides in the, and we just sort of naturally have our coast broken up into, into thirds, the upper, the middle and the lower coast. And so the original thought was to team up with fly fishing guides in the upper middle, lower coast. And the, one of the first guides that I had reached out to was a guy named Jared Malone. Mm -hmm. I don't think he, I don't think he really guides much anymore. Uh, but he was a, uh, very well-regarded guide in the Galveston Bay complex. And, uh, I had reached out to him and he was friends with Tim, Tim Romano. And when I, when I was sharing with him this idea about the book, and what all uh, I was envisioning, he said, you got to reach out to Tim. Tim was from Texas and he had moved to Colorado and was, uh, you know, obviously very well accomplished in outdoor photography. And so Jared Malone is actually who put me in touch with Tim Romano. And then when I met Tim, it was, you know, it's kind of like meeting you. We, we hit it off and uh, I, I knew that, that Tim was going to do this project. Oh, that's cool. And then how much time did it, uh, did it take? really for you to, to, to work out what the book was going to look like and what you thought, you know, I mean, was it always a coffee table book? Like, is that, I mean, that's what I would consider yeah. this. This is a big, nice book. Yeah. Um, so it was always going to be a coffee table book and you just envisioned big, you know, landscape photographs, like, like it turned out, did it, did it, did it turn out like you thought, like, I know that people launch into these projects and then it's kind of like, man, it took so many twists and turns on the way that it's completely different project than what it was intended. But what, what about that for you? Yeah, good question. I, I would say, uh, you know, the, the biggest twist that this book t took was that I probably envisioned it to be about, I don't know, 60 pages. <laughs> uh, and I think it's, I don't know what the last count was. I'm looking, I'm opening my book right now, but it's like 38, I see. Or maybe yeah, it's more. 238 pages. And, and, you know, Tim and I, it, this, this project took two years. Um, and, and we, we, you know, I hired, uh, Julie Savansky, Savasky out of Austin, who used to be with Pentagram to design the book. And, and I'm so glad I, I probably thought that I had the wherewithal to do a book like this. Uh, and then as I got into it, I realized that this was so overwhelming <laughs> and, uh, in, in, laying out a book is really uh, a whole discipline un into itself. And, uh, and so Julie uh, came on to the project and she frankly is uh, the reason why this book turned out so beautifully. It, it really 
it, it, it was sort of bringing a lot. I think Tim took close to 20,000 photographs uh, on this project. Really? And so culling it down to 200 pages was a lot more difficult than it would sound like. Yeah. I mean, going from, from uh, 20,000 photos, how many photos do you think are in here? Cause you got, you got some pages that, you know, have six or eight photos and then you got these giant big landscape ones. Um, do you have any idea how many photos are in here? Yeah. I, I, I think the last count, I mean, it's several hundred. Wow. Yeah. Well, he did a really good job. You know, the photography is, is incredible. Um, and it captures, it captures a lot of um, not just the, the, the cabins and stuff like that, but obviously the lifestyle, I mean, there's like bumper stickers and these, these signs and all this stuff that's kind of around and then people fishing like around these, these cabins. It's really, really cool. Um, you know, Tom, one, one of the things that was really uh, a surprise, I would say doing this book. So we, you know, I, I, I run uh, a little Maverick, uh, HPXT. They don't even make that boat anymore. They make the, you know, the V holes. So, uh, so it's a, it's not a very big boat. And so I've got Tim Romano on the boat, uh, and, and myself. So there's just the two of us, all his gear. And so we show up to some of these cabins literally unannounced and we knock on the door and, you know, I, I could just, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of just chuckling thinking about it. I mean, he and I, uh, knocking on a door, a couple crusty old guys come out <laughs> like, what, what, what the hell do y'all want? And then, and we're sort of pitching this story to them. And then we've got this, this release, this waiver that they're, <laughs> they're a model. And that, that's what Tim's release said. It's basically, you're a model and you're, you're giving us the right to take a picture of you and to put you in a book. And these guys, you know, af after that little introduction, they'd say, you know, it could have been nine o'clock in the morning. They'd say, right. you guys want a beer? And we'd say, <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> I was going to say, man, I mean, looking at some of the pictures here, uh, it looks like you met some, some real characters. Uh, it was so much, that was the big surprise of the book. I mean, literally friends to this day. Yeah. Really and, funny. Well, it's easy to make friends when you start drinking beer at nine o'clock in the morning. That's true. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> what was, what were some of the biggest challenges? Like obviously laying the book out and you get in kind of over your head, like I'm supposed to be writing this book, but I mean, you're not a, what, I mean, what, what do you do for a living? You're not a writer necessarily. Are you? No, 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 no. Just, just a business guy. But, uh, <clears throat> but, but that was, that was difficult. I, th I think really, um, and, and Julie did a lot of the work in terms of laying it out, but, but, but writing the text, making the book, uh, you know, I think the other goal was to make it to make it fun and and as much of a journey going through the book as it was shooting the book. That was kind of the the ultimate dream. Obviously, you can do that a little bit, maybe a little easier with a video. But I wanted I love the permanence of a book, and and it seems like at least these days, you know, video is such a uh not a keepsake mm -hmm. really it's it's sort of it's a one and done you watch it and then you just you forget where you put it and to me i wanted this 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 was such a culmination of of a quest that turned into a reality personally for me just having wanted one and then you know i got it i never i don't know if i ever told you that i got invited post college to go duck hunt in one of these oh, yeah? so sort of a buddy a buddy of a buddy had one in the dead of winter, I, and I kind of talk about it a little bit in the book. And so I sh we show up a handful of us to duck hunt, and it and it's sort of like duck hunt during the day, and then trout fish at night. It just like it we never slept for <laughs> a weekend, and it was so much fun. And so I I just you know having one, and then you know it was really difficult to get it, and then to you know remodel it, and then get it to where it was at least livable. And, and I, my wife's gone out there once. That's the next so question. To get it to, yeah. To, <laughs> Does your wife like this one? Yeah. To, she's been out there once and, and that's a, that's a big accomplishment. And, and so, you know, I felt like th this book needed to, to really embody that journey of what it's like to kind of go from, <laughs> from coast, the, the various coasts that we have and, and just, and, Anyway, so that that was kind of the spirit behind this is really make it kind of a journey and uh, uh, 
Tim did a great job. Julie, of course, did an awesome job as well. And, uh, and, but, but trying to capture that essence was frankly, at the end of the day, took a lot longer and was more difficult than I had expected it was going to be. Wow. Yeah. I can imagine. I mean, did you deal with weather and stuff like that too? Like you got, you got a guy like Tim Romano coming from the Rocky mountains. Is he still living in the Rockies? Yeah, but so, he's, he's a tough guy and he's, he's salty in his own right. So yeah. it was. Yeah, but still, you know, I mean, you're, you you got to go out there in a small boat and you got, I mean, Texas can have some, some very serious weather. So, yeah. you know, you, did you run into any kind of issues like that? I mean, we run into that stuff all the time. As soon as we decide we're going to film a TV show, it's yeah blowing 200 miles an hour and raining sideways. Um, <laughs> did you have any of that kind of issue? We, we we got sprinkled. We never got a downpour. I think I think the biggest issue we we ran into was uh, just the seas. Yeah. And so you know, breaking it up as we did, sort of the upper coast, that wasn't terrible. And and we we could sort of find a port pretty quickly. When we got into the middle coast, uh, that that got a little dicier because we were. Uh, kind of venturing far away from where our home base was. And so navigating across the open bay, uh, it, you know, we got wet, put it that way. Yeah. And it wasn't from rain. And then, and then the South Texas portion, our home base there was Port Mansfield, which is sort of equidistance between Corpus Christi and South Padre. So I ran that little maverick on one day in particular, over a hundred miles. <laughs> And so you know what that's like on a skiff running a yeah. hundred miles. And, uh, so that, that was, you know, it was, it, again, it was just part of the adventure. We were, uh, we had fun. Well, we were a little sore at the end of that trip. Yeah. Well, I'm about to find out what it's like to run a little boat like that. Uh, 1300 miles. Um, wow. we're supposed to have the skiff challenge, which is a race around Florida to uh, bring awareness to the water issues. We were supposed to have it. Um, a couple of weeks ago, what, April 1st, right around April 1st. And it was canceled because of the coronavirus They're trying to reschedule it for September. But it's a race that goes from the Florida, uh, Alabama, Florida line, Florida, Alabama line to around Key West and back up to Jacksonville. Um, so talk about being sore because I mean, I, I've run a skiff a lot and, um, you do get very sore. One of the worst, uh, stories about that, I guess, would be fishing the Gold Cup tournament out of Isla Mirada, running to Key West and then out to the refueling and then going to the Marquesas and doing that every day. So that's like a, I don't know, that's like a probably a 130 mile trip, five days wow. in a row. Man, that, wow. I, know, I just decided I, <laughs> I didn't think I was going to need to learn some spots a little closer to the tournament tournament area if I was going to keep doing that. But um, yeah, very, very tough, but that, yes, in Texas, you're probably across some of these bays. When we fished the redfish tournament in Texas, we fished Kima and Kima was maybe the roughest place I've ever seen. That place that, that was, I, I didn't know how anyone fished there. I mean, literally yeah. coming from Florida and you're, we were so spoiled, you know, we get in these shallow draft boats and we go to the Florida Everglades and the, you know, Flamingo and it's, you can run banks along the way and you're fishing in very shallow water and it's never that rough. So even if it's blowing super hard, but man, we got there. And I mean, I remember one guy, he was so scared that he installed two bilge pumps in the, in the uh, cockpit of his Maverick, two bilge pumps and just had them mm -hmm. like rigged. The going. wires were just going into the console, you know, and he just wanted to make sure that if he swamped that boat, he was going to keep going because the Florida guys were scared to death of that chemo area. It was, it was, that was serious water, man. Um, so well, not only is it deep, but you've got the shipping lane that runs right through the, the middle of chemo. So you get those big ships that come through and boy, they push a wake that will, that will literally capsize a boat. Yeah, I can, I can yeah. believe it. We thought we were going to capsize just leaving. I can't even remember where, where on, on that uh, shoreline and the tournament was being held, but there was a tight channel that went out and man, as soon as you got out, to the markers, the wind hit you sideways and the seas, you know, were huge. As soon as you got out of the lee right there, it was, it was serious. And people were trying to do that in these little boats and it, it was borderline very, very scary. Do you fish that area, Kima? 
I don't much. I, 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 I have, uh, but I don't really anymore. And uh, I, I sort of wait to get down to South Texas. Yeah. That, that's sort of my favorite place to fish. Well, that was a lot different. Um, the South Texas was much more like our Florida fishing than the Kima fishing. We felt way more Port Aransas area. We, we fished down there and it was beautiful. I mean, we were seeing tail and fish all over the place. You could actually see into the water. Um, and, and we felt much, much more comfortable there than we did in Kima. I didn't know what to do in Kima. That was one of the weirdest places to fish. And I just had so much respect for those guys that fish there every year, every day, because I mean, they were doing things that I had never seen before. Like, um, just looking out over the the water and finding fish because they would see where they were feeding and the the oil from the other fish would would come up to the surface and I, I mean I know that you do that in some places and that's pretty common but the water here when I say it was the color of of the the road like it was the color of asphalt it was so gray you could see less than an eighth of an inch into the water. And these guys are able to find fish and catch them there. And I, I mean, yeah. most of the Florida guys were at a loss, just yeah. completely lost, had no idea what to do. And, and yeah. those guys were, they could do it. It's amazing. Yeah, it is. And, and what's, what's even more amazing is, uh, you know, the petrochemical uh, facilities that we have in the Galveston Bay complex. And it is such a prolific fishery. Uh, you know, the, the oysters that are there, I mean, it, the times that I do fish and I've got a lot of buddies that fish in that, uh, in that body of water and they just consistently catch fish. It's, it's really, it's, it's a testament to, to the, the resource that we have here in Texas. It's when amazing. You, when you say petrochemical, um, you, you reference that, what do you mean? Like you're fishing around that, that kind of stuff? You know, there's there's a couple pictures in the book of cabins with the background. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. Like that, like that kind of petrochemical. Yeah, and you see that in Louisiana a little bit too. And it's just the fishing is just so good that you can plop one of these giant chemical plants right in the middle of it, and it's still good. Yeah. It's it's yeah. crazy. But I did I did see that. Um, what about the um? Do they do you have the uh, the small little little oil um? I guess it's a well of some sort, or natural gas well, or an oil well. We we fish around these things in in Louisiana all the time, and yeah. you see you see mm-hmm. those. Do you is that is that something that you're fishing around? Well, definitely in that in that Kima Galveston. I would say that's really more uh, East Bay. Yeah, in the Galveston Bay complex. And you're right. I mean, th- those things can turn into you know sort of a little fish mecca as well. Yeah, I mean anything. And and then you know what we found is that there were there was all sorts of stuff around there. Like, I don't know if the people that were working on the, on the, uh, the boat that, that usually goes out there, their tractor broke or something. They just dumped it in the water and there was all kinds of stuff to hit. We hit, we hit everything. It was a nightmare. First time I went to Louisiana, I had no idea what, what I was doing. And then it, I really got scared because we hit, we hit a number of things that weren't supposed to. Oh, be you did? Yeah. Yeah. We, I mean, and, and, you know, the, the chart says it's clean. So who knows what it was, you know, but it yeah. was pretty solid. And uh, we, we managed to not rip the, rip the motor off the back of the boat. But I mean, within the first 15 minutes, we had hit something really hard, which was probably the best time to hit it because that really slowed us down. And we were like, okay, yeah. hold on. We don't know what we're doing. And if you go up, this little cut that looks exactly like this little cut, this one has a whole bunch of, you know, pipelines and stuff in it. So don't do that. So yeah. you really, really had to be super careful. Um, but that's cool, man. This is a, this is a really great book. I would certainly encourage anybody that, that isn't looking for a coffee table book or, or whatever to check this one out because the photography in this is really good. And it really does tell, you did. You guys did a good, really good job uh, all the way when it's laid out to the photography to just how kind of it it moves from you know down the coast in a in a logical kind of way that I'm not even that familiar with Texas, but I could kind of follow it in the maps. It's really cool. It's really a really a nicely done thing that makes me realize I need to get and fish Texas more often because the amount of of diversity in in the fishing and the landscape and the stuff that you're showing in here, like what we're talking about, like between Kima and Port Aransas, that's quite a different. It really area. is. Yeah. 
but I, I loved it. I, I got to get over there and fish with you. We were planning on, on uh, doing a little something for this book. And um, that's I know. when that hurricane hit, right? What hurricane was that? That was um, one that hit so bad. That wasn't Harvey. Uh, the one before Harvey, I believe. Yeah. But I was, I was disappointed that we couldn't make that happen. Um, so we met uh, at Christmas Island. And um, have, you, have you done any more trips like that? Since then? Well, I thought I thought about a lot more trips like that. I've <laughs> I've I've I've, uh, <laughs> I've I've done some uh, Bahama fishing and then took another big trip. It was it was without the boys to the Seychelles. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah, but 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 you know, I got I think about that Christmas Island trip. What a that was that fishery was something else. And uh, it's really one of my favorite trips ever. And I don't know about you, but one of the things that I liked about Christmas Island so much, and you may have seen this in, in the Seychelles too, I've never been there, but it was just such a lack of, of worldly influence on that yeah. island. Like it was like literally, I mean, you, it's one thing with you fly, like you fly a long way and you get someplace and everybody's wearing like NBA jerseys and, and there's McDonald's and there's, you know, like a, a real American influence. And when we got to Christmas Island, it was not like that. I mean, that was like, you felt like you were out in the middle of nowhere and you, you are, um, you are in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. But that was one of my favorite things about that. Like it was just yeah, super cool. Um, and the people and the people were so welcoming too. What, yeah. wasn't that just, mm. yeah, I could easily go back to Christmas Island. I've been there twice. That was the second time. And I, I, you know, and it was such an important trip for me um, because my, my oldest son had, was graduating high school and that's what we were celebrating. Um, I can't remember your boys are just a little bit older than mine. So what were you guys yeah. doing? No, it was, it was, it was our, our middle child uh, that was graduating. And, uh, and so we drug the older one along with them. And, and uh, I, I don't know if you recall, but, but Ben is at the time, he certainly was the, least fishy of the two boys. Yeah. And so he really felt like it was a graduation present for his older brother. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah, but, but as I remember, he, uh, he did quite well and, and came he around did. doing really well. Yeah. It was, it was funny how similar the trips were because, you know, I was doing a, a, a celebration for my oldest son. You were doing a celebration for your youngest son. Um, my younger son kind of, I mean, I just told my older son, like Turner, we really need to bring Hayden. Like this is a once in a lifetime kind of thing maybe. And let's, let's ask him. And he's like, yeah, of course, let's, let's go. And, uh, so we, we take, we take the two boys and it was fantastic because we just had so much good time together, but I just never forget like just checking you guys out in the airport. I'm like, I bet they're going where we are. And then, you know, the boys are about the same age and, just looked cool. It was a, it was a, it was fun. Sweet deal. Yeah. And we, and we were roommates too, sort yeah. of bunk, bunk house mates. I know, I know. And then, yeah. then it worked out nicely too, because there was a whole other group of people that we, you know, had, had we not uh, gotten together, we would have pretty much just been outsiders to that other, other group. Like, I don't know, the camp could probably hold like what, 20 and yeah. 16 of them were, were came together. So it, it just worked out perfect. It was great. We need to, we need to do another trip like that. Um, yeah, I, I agree. And, and, and I don't know if you remember this, this other, there were sort of like three, three groups in the airport in Hawaii that we were all kind of looking at each other. Ah, I don't, you know, I wonder if this guy and these are going to go to the same place. And it was a, it looked like a husband wife team, a real big guy. And, and I remember sort of talking it up with him and he, he, he was checking out his fly box and all he had really brought were trigger fish flies. You remember this? No, oh, yeah. Yes, I do. And, uh, and, and, and I hadn't really put that on my radar as the quarry that we would be going after. But he started basically telling me that that's all he would go after were trigger fish. And that ended up becoming so fun to go after when we were there. Yeah, that was great. And and that's what was, yeah, I, I think that we even talked about that shortly after you're like, oh, I just met this guy and all he wants to do is trigger fish. And so I had been to Christmas Island almost 20 years before and we didn't throw at a trigger fish one time. 
not, we didn't throw out a milk fish one time. We didn't throw it any, it was not something that they fished for at that time. And so to, to go back and have this change so much that that's like the number one target was interesting. So, I mean, when I went there the first time I was like, what's that? That looks cool. Let's fish for that. And the guides are like, no, no, we go bone fish one up here, you know, and, and we keep going. And I'm like, <laughs> ah, I don't know. It seems like, seems pretty cool. Like you should probably yeah. try to catch one of these trigger fish, but we never did. And, uh, and that added a lot to that trip. Um, because you could catch bonefish, you could have a second rod, the guide would, would be carrying the second rod for you. And then, then you'd start fishing for these trigger fish, but there'd only be like, you know, four or five different shots. And then, then right back to the bone fishing. And then you'd just walk and you could catch bonefish all the way down until you saw more trigger fish. And then you could yeah. move to that. Um, and then the Trevally, uh, Christmas Island had such a good, um, mix and you ended up with the, with the biggest fish of the whole trip. Um, yeah, that I remember. GT. Yeah, a nice, yeah. nice, nice giant trevally. Um, I saw maybe one really good one there, but didn't I didn't have any luck with it. Is that what yeah. you were fishing for in Cosmolito or Seychelles? Yeah, that that's where we went in in the Seychelles was Cosmolito, and and that is that, that's sort of like target number one are the GTs. Uh, we 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 kind of had a marginal trip if I were to grade it. Um, you know, lots, lots on the milks and, uh, and bones and, uh, a few of the, which was really fun, the Indo Pacific permits. Yes. Uh, what a cool fish that is. But the GTs for some reason, uh, were, were out of the lagoon mm. and, uh, they, they claimed that they typically feed on these red crabs. I don't know if you remember all those red crabs in Christmas Island. Well, I do. Uh, and, and we saw, some red crabs when, when we were there, uh, together, but on the trip before, uh, when I went 20 years before they were everywhere. I mean, and I had told my boys about them. I'm like, when we get there, you won't believe what I thought that just happened all the time. But apparently I was there during the walk. Like there's a certain time of the year where those crabs walk and they were, they were on the road so thick that you couldn't see the road. And I remember taking wow. a run and, and I would run and they would get out of the way just before my foot struck down because I was like, oh, I can't run wow. on the road. But I started walking and they would get out of the way just in time for your foot. And so I started walking a little faster wow. and a little faster and a little faster. Turns out that you could run and it just looked like you were just going to land on a bunch of crabs, but they would move out of the way just enough. And it was one of the coolest and weirdest and spookiest runs I've ever had. But I told the boys about it. I was like, you won't believe these crabs. And then we didn't see very many. I was like, yeah. oh, they were like, well, oh, no, I, that's only one time a year. So I had hit it perfect <laughs> the first time. <laughs> well, I, I think I think that's what those GTs like to eat. And uh, in Cosmolito, when we were there, those red crabs, apparently they're very prolific, had gotten blown out of the lagoon. Mm -hmm. and, and so the GTs went outside the lagoon and were feeding on the red crabs that were out at sea. Mm -hmm. Well, that's an amazing, Supposing. I mean, I, I could see how that could happen because that's an amazing amount of biomass, you know, moving out. Those fish have to eat it. You know, they, I, yeah. would, I would imagine if that's what's going on. I've never heard that before, but I don't, I would like to say I fish in the South Pacific much more than I do. I've been there twice. Um, so my, my experience is very limited, but I have talked to some other people that went to the Seychelles. They had a really, really good trip. Um, do you have any other trips that you would, that you think about or you want to do? You know, there's, uh, I, I've never been peacock bass fishing. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and that just seems, especially on a fly rod, like such a cool fish to catch. I, I'd, I'd like to do that. And, uh, I've never been to Alaska. Oh, and, really? uh, yeah. Well, well, both of those are good. First of all, you can come to Florida and do the peacock bass fishing. Uh, you don't have to go uh, around the world. They have some really okay. amazing peacock bass fishing in Florida. Um, and all these other exotics. I'm, 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 I have this one fish on my list that has been on my list for a long time because I had one in college and I've said this, everybody that listens to this podcast is probably really tired of the story, but I had this fish called a Royal knife fish or a clown knife fish. And it's this very strange looking fish that has a, has a, uh, a fin on the bottom that, that kind of undulates. It's not like a, it doesn't have like a tail, like a bone fish. It's got like a more of like an eel look to it. And, yeah. uh, and somehow these have gotten into this, this 
chain of lakes, Lake Ida in the, in Florida. And they're getting really big, like really big. I'd say that the biggest one in the world might be 15 pounds and they're catching them 12 and 13 probably, or 11 and 10. I don't know. They look huge. So I've always wanted to catch one of those since the first time that I saw somebody was catching them. Cause I was like, I had that fish in an aquarium for years. So that would be something, uh, fun to do, uh, to do that. But I, I've wanted to go to the Amazon and do that. Um, then the Arapaima is another fish yeah. that I thought would be cool. Um, but the Alaska trip, that's one I'd love to take the boys or, or, or even my daughter on because it just, uh, that's, that's one like Christmas Island. I mean, if you go up there during the right week, everybody catches fish and there's, there's so many different things. Like if you're a really good fisherman and you're tired of catching salmon, you can go and fish for the rainbows and they can be really hard to catch. And you know, that's like, that's like the guy that went up, went to Christmas Island and all he wanted to do was fish for, for trigger fish. Like he had already caught enough bonefish. He had already caught enough trevally. Now he was just dialed in on these. So you'll get people that'll go up to Alaska and they'll only be interested in the rainbows but you know somebody that has a little bit less experience will catch chum salmon all day long like as many as you want and there's nothing wrong with them they're amazing they're so fun to fish they're, they're actually a little bit too easy to catch for some people they're just like yeah okay <laughs> now move on to the next thing you know right but, but that's what i love about alaska is you could take you could take a family up there where everyone has different interests different different um uh, skill levels, different attention spans, and everybody's going to find something they like to fish for. And, you know, I loved it. Like if you're into really big fish, they got King salmon. If you're into, you know, the, the smaller fish, then you can fish for the, um, the grayling, um, or you could fish for the rainbows or you could, you could just do it in so many different ways. I don't know. That'd be a great trip, really great trip, uh, Alaska. But the Arapaima, I had a guy on the podcast recently and he was catching those Arapaima and that sounded pretty awesome but it didn't sound like you caught a lot that's what i like yeah i think they're pretty hard aren't they yeah Yeah. i think so i mean i think you catch a few a day maybe maybe i don't know um but that's the thing i liked about christmas island is you can catch a lot of fish there and and there were ways that if you wanted to if you were like you know you got tired of catching the the mid-sized bonefish you could you, you could tell the guide like, I only want to try for big ones this afternoon and you weren't going to catch as many, but you might catch some bigger ones. But somebody was just after numbers, man. You could just rack them up. I know all day long. I had that fly, um, the green worm. You remember yep, the green I worm? I remember that. Uh, I, the, I think I may still have a couple of your yellow <laughs> and uh, orange worm. Yeah. Well, I had this fly that was the green worm and it was made out of, uh, it was made out of like a, Looked like a off a skirt or the material that you would make a skirt for a marlin lure, and it was just this green um, plastic with uh, sparkles in it. And um, I had just cut some like a palolo worm, like a little bitty French fry, and I had lashed that on the hook. No hackle, nothing but lead eyes and this strip. And I showed it to the guy on, and I had green ones and I had red ones. And uh, anyway, I showed yellow it to and the orange ones, yellow and orange ones, yeah. Yeah, And I, I didn't tie that many because I didn't think they would work that great. I showed it to the guy day one. And he was like, no, no, I don't. He picked that one. He looked in the box and that's, he, that's the first one he said no to. And then he found out, found like a more conventional one. So I snuck it on there and he's like, what'd you catch that on? Green worm. He's like, really? And he said, let me see. And he, he wanted to take the hook out of the fish himself. And he looks over there and he's like, he just looks at the fly like, green worm the green worm he just kept saying the green worm and then i proceeded to throw that in front of i think every fish that saw it ate it and i just gave him all the rest of them and he was like the green worm he just went home dumbfounded (laughs) the green worm heck i I think all of us were dumbfounded too you you were you were kind enough to give us a few well i was i was happy that that one worked because it is the easiest fly in the world to tie um and you know, I'm, I'm only a marginal fly tire. So I need, I need easy flies to tie. If they get real, you know, crab patterns and crazy things, I can tie them, but I don't like to, I can turn out a <laughs> lot of green worms, dozens, hundreds. Hey, of now dozens. I tell you what we need to do is we, we need to figure out the fly for our, uh, 
our sheep's head, which is essentially like the trigger fish that we were catching. Right. Yeah. And, and, and I think they bite really the same way. At least a few trigger fish that I've caught, it's yeah. a very similar bite to a trigger fish. When you're um, fishing for the trigger or the uh, sheep's head, are they super spooky? Very, very, yeah. very. They're super spooky in um, Flamingo and Florida too. And a lot of people are starting to, to fish for those much more seriously. Um, like going after them as a target and the flies are, and you know, when that starts happening, the flies start to get better and better and better, just like with permit fishing or anything else where now, now if it becomes a thing, then people will start, you know, putting time and effort into making the flies better or whatever. But I always caught them on um, live sand fleas, like when I was bait fish for them. And I know that they eat those things really, really good. So yeah. would, that'd be where I would start is, uh, is try, tie a fly that looks like a sand flea, which hmm. I don't know. That seems, seems tough a little bit. I had to put, put a good fly tire like Drew Ciccone on it and he, let him tie a sand flea pattern for us. But um yeah, how do you fish for them now? Do you do you throw way out in front of them and then just wait for them to find it, or are you trying to cast at them? Yeah, a, li a little, a little of both. I, I we we sort of seem to find at least in the the real skinny water, the little ones are very skittish. Uh, some of these bigger ones kind of will will hunker down a little bit longer, uh, but they're they're very boat skittish. Yeah. You get the boat too close and they're gone. Yeah. Yeah, they have been. I mean, they're real tough. We don't we don't catch a lot of them. Um, the only time I've ever caught a lot of them was when I was fishing with bait and fishing in water that was deep enough that they couldn't see us. And yeah. um, and you could you could catch a lot of them around pilings and stuff like that. But um, you know, they the sheephead does eat well. I don't know if you've ever eaten one. They're kind of hard to clean. They got a lot of bones in them, but they they do eat. Yeah. Um, they do eat very well. So, uh, but more people are trying to catch them. Yeah. Um, so do you fish with like crab patterns or, or what do you, cause they seem like they would be a something that would eat something with a shell on it. If you just look yeah, at the mouth structure. Yeah. And, 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 and it's really the smaller, the better I've yeah. found. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I wouldn't say that I'm a prolific uh, sheep's head catcher, but, um, <laughs> but, but at least the looks that I've gotten, they've tended to be a little bit smaller uh, offering than, than a large shrimp pattern or a large crab. Yeah. Well, I don't know. You got to get it in the water. That's a big, that's a big part of fishing for a spooky fish is they might eat, they might eat stuff that's a little bit bigger, like a, like a permit, you know, maybe a larger fly would work well, but you got to actually cast it over there and you got to get it in the water and, and, and do that all without spooking them. So, you know, yeah. maybe a smaller fly helps with that too. You can cast a lot closer to them. And if you can cast closer to them, then you're more likely to intercept them on their, on their path. But yeah, I'd like to yeah. do that. I'd like to come over there to to Texas. Um, I got some other friends uh, in Texas that I'd like to see too. It's funny because uh, uh, my friend um, he he used to live a lot closer to us, and then um, he is the athletic director at SMU. And uh, it was funny because when I met you, you actually reminded me a lot of of my friend, and I was like, "Huh, that's weird." And uh, that's funny. And then you were both from from Texas, so. It's interesting. Um, so what's on the, what's on the, uh, the horizon for you? You got trips planned, you got, uh, books, you're going to just go back to work. What are you doing? Yeah, no, I, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm running a company, uh, today called score vision, score which vision. is a, yeah, really, really cool company. It's headquartered in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, you know, I live in Houston, Texas. Mm -hmm. So, um, and we have an office in Houston, but they, uh, ScoreVision is a software company that's developed scoring and some video capture technology used primarily by high schools and colleges uh, to elevate their game time production, et cetera. And so uh, we've, I've, I've been involved with ScoreVision for a little over two years now. And so it's been really such a fun venture and uh, the, the business is doing really, really well. And um, we're we're looking forward to school getting back to a new normal uh, sometime soon. So hopefully, hopefully everybody you know is in a position to start schools back up in the fall. I know um, I know at least the schools in Texas are talking about it, but 
well, you know, various I've, parts of the country are a little different. I've already heard that some um, California schools have already just said that they're not going back, uh, which yeah. I think is very early. Like how, how could you possibly know this early that you're not going to open in the fall? It just yeah. seems really early. I agree. I, I think, I think we need to wait and see. I, I just hope that, you know, we all don't just put our hopes on, on some sort of elusive vaccine as the criteria with which we look at the world as normal again. Cause I, I don't know if that's, if that's a, I don't know if that's the proper reality. Yeah. Well, it seems like it's a long way down the road. I don't know. I always, I, I kind of, kind of thought that the whole purpose of the lockdown was to not overwhelm the hospitals and yeah. that people were going to get sick with this, you know, probably, but we don't want it all to happen at once, you know, yeah. so let's, you know, flatten the curve or whatever. But um, I don't know. I hope everybody goes back to school. I hope everybody has a football season this fall and, and, and other sports. Um, as far as score vision goes, does that allow um, like, like high schools or colleges to televise their games or stream their games? Is that what is that kind of the, the technology that, that you're working on? It, it's, it, it, yes, is the short answer to that. We, we actually just acquired a business, closed on it on March 31st. Uh, it was a company based in Sacramento, California called Fantag. And these guys had developed some video capture uh, technology, and it enables somebody to do this OTT type streaming, yeah. the over the over the top type streaming. But it's all through uh, an app, and and you can and put just traditional cameras into the system. But we acquired them really to bring video capture in terms of being able to sling out moments, highlights, and then ultimately. Uh, also be able to provide live stream of athletic games. And, and I guess hopefully looking back, it may have been a very timely acquisition given what's going on. But, but, but the premise behind what we do is really to enable schools to do a lot more with little budgets. And yeah. so um, it's, it's just been fun to see how these high schools and, 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 and colleges, but, but really – you know, people who couldn't afford to do something cool like that be able to do that with our software. Right. That's I'm I'm working with something kind of similar uh, as we do this, and I keep looking down because I'm actually switching these cameras. I've got a bunch of different cameras as well as the Zoom thing that we're doing, um, and then I can switch all the cameras right here. and And I was telling my son, I'm like, what I have right here doesn't cost very much, but it would have been a a production truck parked in the driveway a couple of years ago worth a million yeah. dollars. Right. And now that technology is coming down so much and I can live stream like right now, this is going out to YouTube and Facebook live. We tried to do the, uh, we tried to do the Instagram live, Instagram. which I think, do you think that the people that you work with uh, as far as, uh, all this video capture technology are going to think that it's funny that we couldn't get this zoom call going? I, <laughs> hey, was too I, much we, weren't, we weren't supposed to tell anybody. <laughs> exactly. Well, I mean, sometimes it works really well, but I do believe a hundred percent that, that you're in the right space because I feel like, um, you know, even just in this quarantine, I mean, zoom calls now that's a part of the vernacular. Like people are like, yeah, I do Zoom calls every single day or I, you know, we're doing a video conference or whatever. I think the technology is going to rapidly advance in in all of this to where the the um the audio is going to get far better, the video is going to get far better. I think the cameras in in that come in a computer just like you see the cameras on on cell phones have gotten better, but that's for people wanting to take pictures and stuff like that. I think you're going to see a lot of technology you know, not just with companies like you, but with the big guys like Apple and, and the, the, you know, Samsung's and the people that make the phones, they're going to start making the front facing camera as good as the back facing camera. So people right. can do more uh, video conferencing and things like that. And the next thing, you know, it's going to be like, you have somebody sitting next to you. I mean, we're going to look mm -hmm. back at these days kind of like, I know. you remember when we had those clunky video conference things like a zoom and just kind of, you know, maybe Zoom can keep up. I hope you can Zoom, but um, the you know usually the leaders get overtaken. Um, 
But I do think that there's going to be a tremendous amount of, of, uh, of technology in this space. You guys are probably already working on it and know way more what's coming up than I do, but it is pretty exciting. No, it's fun. Yeah, it's fun. It's fun to be working with kids and, and, and really show them how they can do what they have always wanted to do, but never really could. Um, and, and so that, that's been great. I, I tell you, it, it, ever, ever more today than, than maybe even before, you know, just being out on the water and smelling the salt air is just, oh my gosh, what, what a place to be. And, and, um, you know, for a, for a while, the, the place that I like to fish, like I've mentioned is, is, uh, South Texas. And I normally call home base port Mansfield and they, ha they've had that port, that Marina completely shut down. You couldn't even launch or, uh, or, or take a boat out of the water if it was already in the water, wow. uh, for the better part of a month and a half. And so, you know, uh, I don't know, being, being outdoors is still a magical place. And, and I think this makes it even more so. Yeah. I think I've, I've certainly seen that more people are pushing towards the outdoors. I mean, you have a lot of businesses right now that are certainly struggling and you have a lot of businesses that are, that are doing the best they've ever done. Um, and some of that is fishing tackle, like, um, cast nets. I know that the cast net Barracuda is sold out of cast nets best month they ever had. Um, wow. and, and then, uh, you know, on, on the other hand, you have somebody that's not selling much of anything, but it's like, people want to get back out there so bad and it's the perfect social distancing. I mean, that's what fishing is all about. I don't want to fish next exactly. to anyone. Um, and I don't need six feet. I need six miles, uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> between, between me and the next person. But, uh, I don't know. I think, I think you'll, I hope that people will continue to push towards the outdoors when we get back to normal. And I think we are getting back to normal. Are you seeing in Texas like that port, Fort Mansfield that people can now go and get their boats out of the water. Cause I would imagine you have a tremendous amount of growth on the bottom of your boat after 50 days of quarantine. Um, yeah, no, they, they opened it back up. You know, I, I don't know if this is a, a proper generalization, but, but it, it sort of seems like the people of Texas uh, don't really like to be sequestered in the teepee. You know what I mean? I like if, if, that if they do. <laughs> That they do. Yeah. Like, you, you know, you, you tell sort of generally speaking, uh, you know, the Texans that they can't do something and they want to do what you just said you can't do. So I, I think, I think the troops are definitely restless here. And, um, uh, and, and, and it's, it's really evidenced by just sort of walking around and, and, you know, I don't know. I, I, I think we can do it smart, but, but hopefully, hopefully it's sooner rather than later. Yeah. I hope so, man. I, I really do. Um, but anyway, I know you're a busy guy. Um, so I want to thank you for coming on the show today and showing us this awesome book. Uh, I've got the book right here. Let me show it to everybody one more time with my fancy switching camera here down the thing. It's called Stilt Houses of Texas, Michael Madrano and, uh, Tim Romano. It's a beautiful book. So you should check that out for sure. And, um, that's going to be it for today. It, Michael, how would people get in touch with you? How would they see your book? How could they buy your book? What, um, what, how do they do that? Yeah, we have a, we have a website for the book, stilthouses.com. Uh, you can also find the book on Amazon, but uh, the website talks more about the book and, um, and you can buy it there or you can buy it on amazon.com. Okay. And uh, what about you got any social media or anything like that? Yeah, still houses on Instagram, and then uh, uh, we have a contact page on that website as well. Happy to uh, interact. In fact, I've had a, a couple calls in the last few months on from people wanting to figure out how to how to get a cabin. So I'm I'm happy to be a how to guide as well. That you can tell them how to get a cabin, but not the one next to you, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that one's not for sale. <laughs> but anyway, all right, man. Well, it's awesome catching up with you. I uh, hope you'll tell your boys hi. I know uh, we talked just briefly before. One of them's getting married. That's really cool. And uh, we're just moving into this next season of life. So as as we do that and somebody gets married or I get Turner, he's about to graduate college. Uh, Hayden is, is uh, he's going to be a sophomore in college. So I don't know. We got some kind of, oh, and my daughter's going to graduate from high school next year. So 
there's a lot of possible celebrations. We might be able to go peacock bass fishing or uh, Alaska. That sounds awesome. Uh, hey, uh, you're you're welcome anytime to just come catch a trout or a redfish, or maybe we can try to spice it up and catch a Texas tarpon. Okay, what's a Texas tarpon? A carp? A real a real tarpon, <laughs> but caught in Texas. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'd like to catch a Texas tarpon. I've never caught a tarpon in Texas, uh, but I'd be happy to. I also one day want to go to that area that um, I was warned about so much that I just stayed away. That has the um all the rock Baffin Bay. Baffin Bay, that's it. Yeah. I want to go there sometime. Uh we almost went there in the redfish tournaments, but uh I understand that that's a very tricky place to navigate if you don't know what you're doing. So I'd love to see that sometime. Um and I'd also love to see your cabin, man. That'd be cool. Um let's do it. Okay. Sounds awesome. Okay, so go follow uh Michael Stilt House on Instagram and check out his book and you will be Super happy. All right. Thanks, man. Tell your family I said hi, and we'll talk to you soon. All right. Likewise. All right. See you, Tom. See you. All right. That was cool to catch up with Michael Madrano. Wrote that cool book. As always, this podcast is brought to you by Waypoint TV. You can go and find all of your best outdoor content on Waypoint TV. Specifically, you can go to Samsung Plus, and you can go to these Plus channels like Samsung Plus itself, Zumo, Tubi, Stir, and many others. Also, Pluto running marathons on Friday, on Saturdays and Sundays for Saltwater Experience and Into the Blue on Pluto TV. That's an absolutely free channel, so you can go there and watch that. Brought to you also by Hook. Go to hookgear.com. Use the code SE30 for a 30% site-wide discount. You can get anything you want. Get some shoes. They got awesome shoes. I love the Makos. Um, that's my favorite right now. Uh, I also like the waterproof boots for throwing the cast net. Those are really nice. And um, then they have amazing rain gear. And getting that at 30% off is really good. So you can do that. Brought to you by Manscaped. Manscaped is uh, has the best grooming equipment for all the men in your life. Uh, you, I just bought my son a couple of things there. They got a new thing coming out. It's the Weed Whacker. You stick it up your nose and you'll have no more problems with uh, nose hair anymore. So that thing is coming out and it's going to be really good. And we're brought to you by Kettle and Fire. If you are on a keto, paleo, or um, Whole30 diet, this stuff is great for that. Uh, it's great for digestive health. You can just sip it like a cup of coffee or you can drink it or cook with it or whatever. Bone broth. Bone broth can be a real pain to cook yourself. It takes about 20 hours. It stinks up your whole house. I've done it many times. And uh, while I like bone broth, sometimes I don't like it enough to stink up my whole house. So you can get kettle and fire bone broth shipped right to your house. Use the code waypoint at kettleandfire.com. You can get a discount on that as well. Okay. We're also brought to you by Barracuda Tackle. Barracuda Tackle, the makers of the finest cast nets, they also have this really awesome D-hooker. It's the best D-hooker, in my opinion. It's long, and you don't get bit by any sharks or barracudas or kingfish or whatever, and it actually takes the hook out for you. It's made out of really heavy-duty material, so one can last you a whole season or maybe more, depending on how much you fish. Um, So anyway, the Barracuda Tackle, they're putting that out. They're putting this magnet out where you can put the magnet on your boat. You can keep all of your hooks and jigs and everything like that. And they're coming up with this cool little, little boat wrench that we're actually going to have some giveaways on this, this kind of stuff coming up soon. Not to mention that they make the best cast nets in the world. So Barracuda Tackle, they are a sponsor of this show. We're glad to have them. So if you could support them, that would be fantastic. Okay. That's it for today. We will see you next week.